They say the eyes are the mirror of the soul. An old friend once told me that while Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel, people were still living in caves, discovering fire. I pretended I'd seen it all. I thought I knew all there was to know. <laughs> My God, how ignorant I had been. Until I met Paul. I met Paul Whitman on a cruise to London. We were both sailing from New York. It was unexpected to meet a man like him, considering how different we were. I was a salesman, this being a business trip and my second time in London. For him, on the other hand, this was a chance for a new life. Europe, as he put it, might be the missing piece to American life and why he never felt at home. In these six days crossing the Atlantic, we struck an unlikely friendship. I was always the quiet, pragmatic type. I was taught never to say something unless spoken to. Paul, on the other hand, well, he was an open book. At the time, I assumed he simply liked the sound of his voice. It was early in the evening, and we were on the first deck. I was enjoying a glass of whiskey, old-fashioned. He has to borrow a cigarette. We continued to speak until late in the evening, and I was baffled by how enthralled his stories had me. The most interesting of all were his stories of the occult. He told me about a very peculiar book he found. I distinctly remember him saying how the book found him. He told me about the contents of this book, about dark rituals, cosmic entities, and forbidden lore of the nature of the universe. Things I would now give anything to forget. At the time, I patiently listened. It was starting to get cold and I wasn't dressed properly, but for some reason, I just couldn't keep away. The next morning, I awoke and waited for him on the first deck, but he was nowhere to be found. I asked around about this young man, but strangely, I couldn't find anything about his whereabouts. Apparently, there was no cabin for a poor Whitman. Later in the evening, I made my way back and, as if answering my plea, found Paul standing there. He asked for another cigarette and then asked if I wanted to hear the rest of his story. Naturally, I said yes. Perhaps it was the way he spoke, or the stories he filled my head with, but somehow, Paul looked different. His blue eyes seemed to sparkle, as if the very cosmos were trapped inside those two round orbs inside his skull. What's more, his very presence seemed, no, felt different. Despite his patchy clothing, which was falling apart at the seams, or his rugged appearance, I felt a sense, or should I say connection, to this man. It was somehow calming, and yet terrifying. I still don't know why I welcomed his presence the first time we met. Perhaps he reminded me of my upbringing, growing up on a farm, seeing my father looking similarly knowing he died a drunk, without a penny in his pocket. I wanted to believe I felt compassion for this poor man. Looking back, I see now my thoughts were not my own. I convinced myself that he was something more, a rarity, one that has so much more to tell. The stories he told me that day ruptured something deep within my psyche and perhaps even my soul. Like a web of madness, each tale more unsettling than the last, as Paul revealed more twisted abominations that defied the laws of nature. He spoke of forgotten cities in the desolate corners of the earth, where the very fabric of reality seemed to warp and twist. His hands trembled as he recounted his own brush with the unknown. 
A brush that left him forever changed. We continued to speak to one another over the next four days. For some reason, our conversations shifted to mundane topics. My manners got the better of me, and so I asked him if he was married. He stood there in silence for a moment. Surprised, I looked at him. I realized the question made him feel uncomfortable. But he relented and told me he had a wife once. But she and their son died in childbirth. As he shared the painful chapter of his life, I sensed the weight of his loss. We stood there in silence, enveloped under the vast night sky. A profound empathy stirred within me as I listened to his story of love and tragedy, transcending the casual friendship that had sparked just days before. Underneath the starlit canvas, I thought about how some wounds never heal. At the time, I didn't realize the weight he was carrying. In his stories, he passionately spoke about another land, somewhere north, far beyond what we knew. And as I write this, I know we have found that land Paul spoke of, but we have yet to understand what lies beyond. It only came to our knowledge a few years ago, in 1909. Back then, we speculated about what existed in that place. The ancient Greeks even had some knowledge of it. Although misunderstood, they pointed out one thing correctly, that no man can ever live there, probably for different reasons back in their day, as Paul said. Except for a few, the world seemed much smaller to them than it is to us now. I wonder if it is indeed much smaller to us now as we know it. Upon debarking, we said our farewells, and I suggested we should keep in touch. I wrote my London address on a piece of paper from his notebook and said to him he should come visit and maybe talk about his stories more. Paul smiled and promised he would reach out. He mentioned that he had a gift he wanted to give me, but he wasn't ready to part with it just yet. My mind immediately raced towards the thought of that dark grimoire he spoke of. A young boy was outside my doorstep. As I opened the door, the boy quickly gave me a letter and then scampered off. The letter read from Paul Whitman. Excitedly, I tore open the envelope and read the letter. It was only a single line that read, Come, my friend, immortality awaits. I followed the scribbled address and found myself in front of the Royal London Hospital. Upon entering, I approached the front desk and asked the staff if by chance there was a Paul Whitman here. There was a sudden look of shock on her face at the mention of Paul's name. She asked me how I knew about Paul, to which I recounted my encounter with the young boy at my doorstep earlier this morning. The nurse hesitated briefly, then told me to follow her. As she guided me through the hallways, I felt a sudden rush of cold engulf my body. For a moment, I thought I saw my own breath. What was Paul doing here? Before I could ponder the meaning behind all this, I found myself standing in front of the doctor. He firmly shook my hand as he introduced himself and continued to walk me into a room. What is your relation to Mr. Whitman? He asked as we walked. I met him on the ship that brought me here, I responded. Immediately, the doctor stopped and looked at me, giving me that same expression as the stewardess. I beg your pardon? You said you met him, as in you are not related to him. No, doctor, I said. I've only known him for about a week. I received a letter from him telling me to meet him at this location. Please, doctor, is something wrong with Paul? The doctor looked down at the floor briefly and spoke. <sighs> I shouldn't be telling you this because you are not related to him, but I'm afraid Mr. Whitman is dead. 
The room began to shrink around me as those words hung heavy in the air. It felt like an eternity before I finally spoke. How? How did he die? The doctor gave me a concerned look. I was hoping you might help us figure that out. I gave him a fearful look. The doctor took a deep breath and said, Come this way. The morgue was wide and circular. In the middle lay a single steel bed. Atop it lay a white sheet and a small mound hidden underneath it. I stared at it oddly. Paul was much taller than whatever lay under this cloth. What lay here was no more the size of an adolescent. I must have fainted. For one moment, I was staring at the blanketed mess. And the next, I was lying face down on the floor. I rose and stared at the thing that lay on the table. I... I think it's Paul, I said. It was Paul, to be sure. But his body was in every sense wrong. His limbs were contorted, bent, and broken in ways that openly defied the laws of reality. Somehow, even worse than this, was Paul's eyes, or lack thereof. On his now malformed face were two empty sockets filled with the void of nothingness. Before the doctor could say a word to me, I ran, and I did not look back. As I got home, I kept thinking of what I saw. The image burned into my memory. Paul's face, his parted lips, the wide open jaw, the red in his cheeks. Despite the horrible malformations on his face, I couldn't help but create an image of how Paul faced his final agonizing moments with a smile on his face. I twisted the events in every impossible way, and yet I could not answer the riddle of what happened to Paul Whitman. Several days had passed, and I was finally getting back to some sense of normalcy in my life. I had come home from work one day to find a package on my doorstep. I picked it up and examined it. No address anywhere to be found. Unsure of what to do with it, I took it inside for the time being. After having my supper, I poured a glass of liquor and sat by the fireplace. I decided to open it. The box was light, almost empty. But as soon as I lifted the lid, the blood left the tip of my fingers. From within, a pair of blue eyes were looking back at me, rolling around in that velvet box. I threw it in the fire. Immediately, I realized what or whose they were. I turned around and rushed to the front door, trying to get out and alert the police. But I found myself locked inside. For a moment, I felt panic gripping my mind. But I knew I must have locked the door on my way in. So I looked for the key in my pocket. I found it and pushed it in to lock. But to my surprise, it didn't fit. From behind me, I could hear something. The sound of laughter. <laughs> I went back into the room and I saw a shadowy figure. He chuckled as he turned around. <laughs> I knew this man. I recognized his patchy clothing, the sound of his laugh, and that smile. Oh, that horrible smile. I saw Paul Whitman. Not understanding what happened, I asked him if this was a circus act he likes to play. But he continued to look at me, intrigued by my presence and demeanor. What are you doing here? He curiously inquired, to which I replied, I saw your body today, Paul. What is going on? Did you? 
he promptly interjected me. I got a package. Dear God, I have to call the police. Oh, but what good is calling the police? What? What are you? My voice trembling as I spoke. Hmm. It would be easier to show you. He points to a floorboard which began pumping violently, almost breaking from the impact coming from beneath. I leapt back as the floor finally burst open, sending splinters and debris flying about. I felt my back hit something. I turned around to see Paul standing behind me, grinning that insidious smile, hollow eye sockets as black as the void. In his hand, he was holding a crowbar. He lunged at me, trying to force me down into the pit beneath the floorboards. Somehow, despite his twisted appearance, his strength was still only that of a man. With all my might, I wrestled free from him, taking the crowbar into my hand. I raised the iron above my head and swung down with all the force I could muster. The impact made his head snap back, blood gushing from his mouth onto the carpet. His body started twitching, and as I stood, Paul looked back at me, and I could see his eyes, bright blue, pleading for his life. I hit him once again, then again. In a frenzy that took over, I started smashing every piece of his body. Until my arms felt numb. I stared in disgust at my horrible act. Paul's face was now an unrecognizable, bloody mass that sat atop his neck. In the aftermath of that gruesome act, I stood amidst the shattered remnants of Paul Whitman's body. The room was silent, save for the crackling flames in the fireplace. I was gasping for breath. The realization of what I had just done, slowly setting in. I stumbled backward, attempting to make sense of this nightmarish event. The fireplace cast shadows across the disarray, as if the room itself recoiled from the malevolence that unfolded within its walls. I sank to the floor, haunted by the frenzied assault. The crimson stains on the carpet seemed to seep into my conscience, promising an everlasting mark. The silence hung heavy, broken only by the echo of remorse. I pulled his body and crammed it beneath the wooden floorboards, nailing it shut, then pulled the carpet over it, finally wiping away any traces of Paul's existence. The next morning, I left back for New York. A few months pass, and I get a letter. It bore no return address, only my name, scrolled across the front in a shaky hand that seemed to echo the horrors I thought I had buried in London. I hesitated before breaking the seal, a cold sweat forming on my brow as I unfolded the worn parchment within. Dear friend, I hope this letter finds you in good health. I trust that you've had time to reflect on our shared experiences. You see, death is not an escape, nor is it a resolution. It is but a transition, a passage to realms beyond your comprehension. I watched as you tried to bury the memory of that night, as if sealing my existence beneath the floorboards would somehow free you from the consequences of your actions. Alas, my dear friend, you cannot bury the truth as easily as you buried my body. The box you received, the eyes that stared back at you, they were but a glimpse into the nature of what lies beyond. A gift, 
And what have you done with it? To say I'm disappointed in you would be an understatement. I admit, I haven't told you enough. I wish we had more time, but I sent you a gift. The mirror of my past, of my memory, imprinted on my soul. You chose to destroy it. Reality is a fragile construct, and you have shattered it with your own hands. We will see each other again, but until that fateful moment, yours in eternal torment, Paul Whitman. As I read those words, a chill gripped my soul. The specter seemed to linger in the room. I crumpled the letter, but its malevolence message clung to my psyche like a leech. I took a step back, and the wooden floor cracked beneath my feet as I lifted my head to see an antique mirror standing in front of me with its reflective surface seemingly untouched by time. The mirrored image unveiled a shadow wrapped in an unsettling, hollow, and haunted presence. Through the eerie silence, I found myself locking eyes with the figure reflected before me. I heard a whisper, and I answered back. Dear Paul, I hope we'll see each other soon. Your friend in torment. Edgar.